Awesome. All right. So let's kind of take a peek at, oh boy, I apparently closed my PowerPoint. Give me just a second. We may be using Teams. I'm not quite sure how that's going to work. I will keep you guys posted because I do like that Zoom. I'm able to upload it on the channel and record it. And I got to figure out kind of how Teams work. I'm not as Teams fluent as I am with Zoom. So if anything changes, I'll keep everybody posted. So here we go. Let's talk about money. <laughs> Everyone's favorite subject. So once you have a diagnosis in play and you have a child who's completed the Part C Child Find and or Part B program, they may qualify for a couple of different things that I want you guys to have an understanding of. Is anybody aware of what a McKay scholarship is? Yes. Partially. Okay. So what's your understanding and knowledge of a McKay scholarship? <laughs> Basically, that there is a scholarship you can apply. <laughs> okay. Okay. That's fine. And it, and it covers... Um, and it covers the uh, tuition for like, and basically, I'm not sure if it's any school or now. So you can cover, it covers your tuition like private schools, maybe some services. I'm not sure. Yeah. So you're kind of there. Jess, what is um, other information that you have on the McKay? Um, so um, the McKay is basically, so depending on the eligibility that you have and the services that are outlined on the, A, the IEP, um, it's going to either in increase or stay at an initial time for your matrix score. So depending on if you have more services, your score will be higher. And so then there's money allocated for that particular child that um, if in some case you are not um, happy or satisfied with their, their homeschool, they're able to use that, that my case scholarship to go to another school that will accept it, or they're able to um, pick a school that's on a predetermined list um, and you can use that um, for those schools that will apply for tuition towards their schools and not necessarily it's going to cover the full tuition so parents are responsible for whatever tuition is not covered um, so yeah that's basically so that's a pretty good summation so a McKay scholarship is a scholarship available for parents kindergarten to age 22 that provides funding for them to basically have school choice. So whether they choose a public or a private school, so this is kind of a misnomer, McKay will also apply to another public school. So it'll give you the flexibility to let's say, uh, my child's enrolled in Miami High School and I preferred for them to go to Coral Gable Senior High School and Coral Gable has an opening and they will take my scholarship, I can transfer my child using the McKay funds. So it adds to kind of their tuition dollars. So as a taxpayer, we give money to the government to kind of make sure that children are educated. So based on that, each child is a revenue of around $13,000 per school. So each school receives around 13,000, well, somewhere between 10 and 13, depending on the school, the county, et cetera, et cetera. Um, thousand dollars upon enrollment that is included in the person's, in the school's budget. And based on that, the child enrolls in their school. Obviously, the more services a child has, the more funding is necessary for that child to be educated. So if you have children, for example, with special needs, they have higher funds so that they can have basically more support in structured classrooms, aids, services, et cetera, et cetera. That's what that money is there for. Um, do you know when you are eligible to apply for a McKay scholarship? Anyone? After, um, well, I know we have, you have to have been enrolled for one year in public school. And um, it has an age to, I think it's five. I, I don't remember the age, but I know we have to be. That looks pretty good. So the <laughs> eligibility for McKay is you need to be enrolled one school year. However, McKay counts a school year between October and February. Why? I don't know. Don't ask me. Those are things I don't know. Um, so as long as your child is enrolled in a public school between October to February, when the count dates occur, and is... Um, eligible for services, so has an IEP, or in some cases a 504, but almost always an IEP, then you are eligible to apply for a McKay scholarship, and then the amount awarded is based on their matrix score, as Jessica was saying. What is a matrix score? 
basically it's a score, it's a bracket score. So you can be a 251 to a 255. So you can be 251, 252, 253, 254, 255. Based on your matrix score, you will receive a certain amount of money. Generally, it's based on your amount of services. Sometimes it is, sometimes it's not. At times, people who require more support for some sort of reason have a lower matrix score and not the highest that they need. So you really wanna look out, especially in the beginning of a child getting an IEP, even if they don't apply for a matrix, a matrix score is assigned to them. That is really helpful information. Why? Because a 253 or under will not give you more money than a gardener. And that is really, really good information to have and understand. It is very rare. I have not seen a child with a 255 score. That is not a complex medical need learner. So really, only if you have a 254 matrix score is it even pertinent to apply to a McKay versus a Gardner. Because if you're gonna get the same amount of money and not as much flexibility, I'd rather just go get the one that has more flexibility and easier to apply to, right? So that is a really important piece of the pie that a lot of parents miss. They're like, oh, I know about the McKay, it's gonna like pay for school. And I'm like, well, your kid's matrix score is 252. So you might as well apply for a Gardner, you'll get more money. Is Gardner just like, there's a, a, an age cut off, right? Nope. That nope. No? Mm -hmm. Well, that I didn't know. No. So we'll talk about Gardner in a little bit. So then remember, these are pertinent to Part B services. So Part B, remember ages 3 to 22. Pam, I have a question. How do we figure out like what's approximate num like metric number for this? Oh, you're state? not supposed to figure it out. The school signs a matrix number. So during the IEP okay, meeting, you ask the ESC director, what is the matrix score? They have okay. yeah. um, Pam, I have a question. Yes. It's more like a, I don't know, you have a lot of experience with this, maybe you have an opinion. Is there cases where they have like, they receive a lot of funding and they're not really, like the school is not really using the, all of that funding for that child? Mm. Do you think that then the school has an interest in keeping the child with that? I second this for sure. Like I've yeah. seen it like, like <laughs> some, yeah. no, some students yeah. who are really like, like really getting like a lot of progress and they just keep them in a self-contained class because that's how they get the money instead of just putting yeah. them in the mainstream class. But sometimes it's not even the school. Sometimes it's the same parent. So I've heard parents say, I want my child to continue to have an IEP because then they'll be eligible for more funds in other times. So sometimes it's a two-way avenue here. I don't always blame schools. I've heard parents say the same thing in order to keep their matrix score higher. But it's still like, even though if you're in the mainstream class, you will still have an IT if you, ha you, if you have to. Yes, but think about kind of a, an accommodation learner versus a self-contained learner. Generally, I would say that you would need a higher matrix score for a self-contained classroom versus someone in a mainstream classroom. That person requires more services because they require the aid of a teacher's aid, a smaller classroom size. So the matrix score logically should be higher. But sometimes depending on kind of how the parent advocates for services or an advocate, a matrix score could be a lot higher for a learner in a mainstream classroom versus in a self-contained classroom. That's where I mean that there's also a politicking kind of engineering to this. Because like, it's not only the need. I, I've seen kids with um, different ma matrix scores, like, mm -hmm. uh, and they're receiving the exact same services. That's kind of where, like, it's weird. <laughs> it's weird, but it happens, right? Because it depends kind of, if they're receiving the same services, hypothetically, they should have the same score. I would say most of our kids land between 253 and 254. Most of the time that I see. Another thing I wanted to ask, because I've seen a parent do this, and I've seen her talking about it, but I'm not sure how it laid out. Sure. She, um, she went to child fine and got the, the IEP, but she mm -hmm. kept the child in an ABA program for okay. the year. All right. With an IEP, because she thought she, she was going to get the funds. Okay. And then I saw her discussing with school about this. No. Uh, because they, they said no. So I, that's something that is important for them to understand that the child yes. actually has to go to public school in order to have McKay. I don't know about the other one. But. No, Gardner, no. McKay, yes. So the school is absolutely correct. This is a state sponsored scholarship and it does require enrollment in a public school for a school year. 
So whether that's pre-K, kindergarten, second grade, third grade, fourth grade, you need to be enrolled one year, which is October to February within this program in order to qualify for McKay scholarships. So that now your first question, Thelma, just to kind of get on that is you said something about maybe the school would want to keep a child there. This is why this is a parent led and a parent choice scholarship. It doesn't matter if the school wants to keep you, you have the right as a parent to place your child wherever you deem fit. So if you think that they should not be going to Miami Senior High School, but rather Barbara Goldman or Coral Gable Senior High and they have an opening, you are in all your right to transfer them, just like you're in your right to transfer them to Pinecrest, if you wanted to. Yeah, select. but like, if you want to keep them in the same school, mm -hmm. but you know they need less um, support. The, the, the matrix is, is not the amount that, that it's showing that they need, you know what I mean? And then school, I feel like school pushes to keep them on a higher score, like higher matrix score. And I feel like that's about money for the school. I don't Sometimes, know. Sometimes, but I really like to take individual cases. I don't like to take a blank case like that because I want to think like, why is it that the school thinks that this child needs to be in a self-contained classroom? Why is it that, you know, they, you know, can you do a transition period into a mainstream classroom? There's a lot of different factors because I, I don't want to just say every school wants to keep a kid in a self-contained classroom because at some points what's happening, at least in Broward County is we are losing the amount of schools that have self-contained classrooms. Okay. So, and I think it's the same as happening in Miami, like for the pre-K program right now, I think there's somewhere under 20 schools that are eligible that have that program. However, we all know the number of cases of ASD is just rising, right? So one in every 44 kids is having it. Where are we going to put all these kids? Right? So then I, I would almost think like numbers wise, it's, it, you want to kind of do the opposite. Put some kids in Main Street versus continuously self-cluster them. But again, I, I have been lucky in terms of having a good working relationship with schools that the kids that I believe should be in a mainstream classroom are generally supported through that transition. I have never had a school tell me, and that's why I just tell you, I like to take things individually. I've worked with many different schools in the three counties, and when we come to an agreement as a team of what meets the standard of going into a mainstream classroom, it's generally validated by the school. So I, I have not had that experience. Now, some people may, but I, I just have not. So I don't know. When advocates talk about that, I'm like, I don't know what you're talking about. I just, it's never happened to me. I also have a question, like, for how long does the scholarship valid? For oh, example, awesome. So it's like, for example, okay, so like you spent like one year in public school, you're eligible for Mackey, they approve the Mackey, and then like because of this uh, scholarship, you're placed in the private school. So mm -hmm. like how long does it like so one year or they keep them like till? No, as long as you keep applying and you keep milling eligibility, they will keep renewing Mackey. Generally, you okay, still okay. need to complete your evaluations. So your reevaluations every three years, kind of filling out a new IEP, generally kind of getting an assessment of your, your matrix score, but it's pretty continuous once you meet in case, in case you do that, um, who makes the reevaluation? Do the public school, right? Yes. So there's two kind of prongs here. So the public school system can do it if you maintain your child in a public school system, or there's also an off branch in each county that is dedicated to evaluating kids in private schools. So, or even providing services to private school. Okay. All righty guys, so that is the McKay. And then this is just to give you guys an understanding. Um, it was created in 1999 and it's intended to help kind of students with disability gain access to kind of better education and their parents have freedom of choice in terms of picking a school for them. And then here are the things that kind of the divine 13 that you can pick through of what will qualify you for um, a disability, i.e. an IEP, i.e. the McKay. So an intellectual disability, hearing impairment, visual impairment, dual sensory uh, processing, orthopedic impairment, or other health, health impairment, which is apparently here is where ADHD lands. I don't know why it lands there. I don't know if they're going to make another category for it, but right now it's just OHD. I'm sorry, OHI. So another health impairment. Um, emotional or behavioral disability, specific learning disability, ASD, or developmental delay. Now, kind of, all right, McKay's about choice. What are your choices? So they can attend another public school within the district. This is a very big kind of contentious point way back when, 
A lot of families want to cross district lines. You're not allowed to cross district lines. So if you live in Miami-Dade County, if you want to pick a, a school in Homestead and you live in Miami Lakes, there's no problem. But you cannot pick a school in Miramar when you live in Miami Lakes. That is outside of the district bounds, unless it's a private school, right? This only applies to public schools. Um, you can pick another public school in the adjacent district if they have space and eligibility. So generally, another school in a, an adjacent district, so let's say you live in Miami Lakes, which is on the border of Broward and Miami-Dade County. If you live in Miami Lakes and Broward has space, Broward has to prioritize kids in its county. If they still have space, then they will take you. Now, in South Florida, the likelihood of Broward having space for you as a Miami-Dade student is very little. The likelihood of Palm Beach having space for you if you're in Broward is very little. It can happen in theory. I think this is more for like the upper 63 counties of Florida. So let's say you live in like Orange County and then, you know, Tampa has a, an opening. I think you can do it. Um, but it, when you have such huge populated school districts, you don't tend to have a lot of choice outside of it. But you are eligible. So if you do find one, then okay. And then you are attendance is um, at an eligible private, sectarian, religious, or non-sectarian school, that's no problem. So if you wanna go to Our Lady of the Lakes, if you wanna go to uh, Poznak, you wanna, no problem. As long as the school also takes McKay. Most private schools, I would tell you take McKay as a scholarship option. Now, how does my child become eligible for McKay? And by the way, I can send out the, the presentation to anybody so a parent can be better informed if they wanna read it out. I have a PDF version of it, I'll try to upload. Um, basically, your child has to attend, here's the big marker, right, Thelma? They need to attend prior school year attendance in a public school, at least between the times of count, counting of eligibility, which is between October and February, either any grade between pre-K or 12. Um, they need to be enrolled either in a school that's funded, so like the Florida uh, School for the Deaf and Blind, that's one in, up in St. Augustine, um, or there's another one, I think, down in Miami. Um, placed under services under SIS, so specific like daycares or programs will have this. Um, has an IEP or a 504 plan. Um, be a foster child or a dependent child of someone in the military. So let's say you were enrolled in a public school in Colorado and then you moved to Florida, you would be eligible. This is not a ton of case, but these are just eligibility statuses, just so you guys are aware. Um, they make exceptions to obviously military servicemen because they have to move at the mercy of wherever the military sends them. Um, and the parent has to notify the school district that they're going to use it and where they're going to enroll the child and then kind of look for the school in the enrollment packet when you apply at least 60 days before when they're due to enroll. I always encourage parents as soon as McKay opens up to apply. Usually it starts opening up sometime around March or April. Be the first to apply all the time for every scholarship because all these funding streams are first come first serve. Right, so if you wait till July to apply, even though you, there should be money, there could be no money for you. And because you applied in July, there's no money for you because you could have applied in March. Um, and the parent has to have obtained acceptance if they're gonna go into a private school of the private school. So you can't just say, hey, I wanna send my kids to Pinecrest. Pinecrest needs to say, yes, we want your kid here. Here's the acceptance letter and I'm gonna upload it to McKay of saying that yes, this child will be an eligible um, student for Pinecrest. Are first year kindergartners eligible? Yes, as long as they've been enrolled in a public preschool program. So that would be usually in a language therapy based classroom, a self contained classroom. Um, and your child has to be five years old before September 1st of the school year, but that's across the board everywhere. That's the other requirement for McKay. Your child needs to be five years old by September 1st. Cool. Now, now comes the gardener. I'm a bigger fan of the gardener. I'm just gonna always be explicit about that because the gardener does something that McKay does not. It allows a lot of flexibility of where those, that funding goes. So you cannot, FYI, because of course someone has tried to do this and, and now they make you sign like a vow and you have to get it um, notified. You can't have the gardener and the McKay at the same time. Please tell parents you cannot have both at the same time. You can apply to both at the same time. I don't understand why you would do that. 
that's stupid, pick a lane and don't stick to your lane. Um, because that's considered fraud, right? Like, how are you going to get the money from the McKay and the gardener? No, stick to a lane. So the gardener, now it's known as the PLSA, um, is different than other state scholarships because it allows parents to kind of use those funds directly for therapeutic needs as well as for schooling needs. What's another big plus of the gardener? You're eligible for the gardener at the age of three, not the age of five. So let's say mom and dad really want to enroll their child in a full-time early intervention intensive ABA program. Guess who can help them pay for that? The gardener, right? It can help pay for co-pays. It can help pay for the therapy itself. If you want your child to have extra speech and language therapy services that you can pay for cash, guess who can pay for that? The gardener. Guess if your child needs a device to speak with because they're enrolled, you know, and they need an AAC device. Guess who can pay for that? The gardener. Guess if you want your child to take private swimming classes as like a safety measure. Who can pay for that? The gardener. So the gardener gives you lots of flexibilities to not just kind of pay tuition for a specific school, but rather have flexibility in how you use those funds for either funds for therapy, funds for schooling, and or supplies needed for the child's um, best interest. So like educational or therapeutic supplies. Um, it includes also technology. And let's say the child doesn't use all the money, you can roll over the money into a college savings account, FYI. So I have a lot of parents who don't use the money by the end of the year and I'm like, roll that thing over and it's use it or lose it. So, you know, you get a certain, and then this is the great thing about the gardener, it's not income eligible. So neither the K, the McKay or the gardener are income eligible. So if you make a million dollars a year or you make $2 a year, everyone's eligible to apply for it. Um, the other thing too is, oh, go ahead. That information. <laughs> what? Thank you for that information about, um, College fund. I didn't know that. <laughs> yep. So you can roll over the, there's a specific way to roll it over. I did it with two families and the money has been save, sitting there in savings for them to roll over for some, some other time. Right. Who knows, maybe in college or trade school, whatever, but that's $6,000 they didn't have before. Right. So when they didn't use it, I said, okay, let's reapply and then we can pay for something else next year. Um, and praise God that they didn't need all of it. Right. Like the kid had more than enough services. That generally is not the case for most people. Most of my people use their gardener really quick. But if you do have extra money, that's a really great way of funneling it so it doesn't get lost. Um, the other big thing is the gardener amount varies depending on the county that you are in Florida, not the matrix score. So it'll only be eligible based on where you live in Florida and then when you applied. But the full 100% amount right now is like $11,150 something dollars, I think. Um, if you live in Miami-Dade County and Broward County, I think it's 1100 flat, maybe but it's around $11,000. So it, it raised up a little bit even since this last time, which I'm really excited. So let's say you have a kid at a 252 matrix score, he would still be eligible for the 11,000, whatever. If, it's, if he's 251, 254, everyone gets a standardized amount because it's based on the county of where you live. Now, just to give you guys an idea of what can you use it for? You can use it for tuition and fees at a private school. You can use it as a post-secondary institution, a homeschooling program, to pay for ABA, to pay for full-time or part-time tutoring, to pay for virtual programs, online fees, exam fees, uh, contract services from school districts. If you need to pay for a teacher valuation, you can pay for it through Gardner, a uh, 529 plan or a Florida prepaid, um, instruction material, horse music and art therapy and transition services. So as they get a little bit older or in the younger stages, kind of helping them kind of get ready for school, they need a, a readiness program and a boost, you can enroll your child in that and you can have them pay for that. Now, here's your question, <laughs> Dalma. How long does it last? They can continue to receive the gardener from three all the way to the time that they graduate high school or 22, whichever comes first, um, or until they return to public school. Now, Here's kind of the interesting feat with Gardner. You are not allowed to enroll in a public school if you receive Gardner. That is the caveat. If your child is enrolled in a public school, you cannot receive Gardner. You can receive McKay, but not Gardner. Okay? Private and school, no problem. What if chapter school? Chapter school is Charter okay. school is considered a public school. Oh, sh okay. Yeah, yeah, no, no. Can't do it if you're... So like, it, it has to be like your kid has to be enrolled in private school or... In private school. Mm -hmm. or homeschooling right 
Oh. Which is the same. I was just like having those all good thoughts and you just cut it. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. Yes, Charter. No, it's not your fault. I didn't make that law. I wish I did. I'm not that I'm not that powerful. Um, the other big thing I want you guys to understand. Three years ago, when people applied for the gardener all the way up to July or August, there was a lot of funds for them. Not anymore. So many people have found out about the gardener and meet the eligibility for a gardener. So to meet the eligibility for a gardener, just FYI, you need to have turned three years old by September 1st of that year. You need to have a diagnosis of one of the 13, right? Like your child's deaf, has ASD, developmental delay, or an IEP. If you have both, it's even better, but it doesn't, you can qualify with just the diagnosis. Um, and a, it has to be a comprehensive diagnosis, FYI, if you don't have an IEP um, by that time. And then I always encourage parents, make sure you go on Gardner when you go on the, on the website and get a notification when that thing opens. Because get, Gardner guarantees money first to everyone who's been enrolled already in the program. Right? So if you've already been enrolled and you reapplied, those people get money first. Then they'll open up for new candidates if there's funding available. Guess how easy that runs out now? In like two, three weeks. So I make sure parents, like in April, I'm like, yo, apply, apply, apply. They just open. Like as soon as a parent tells me, I'm, I like mass blast, I'm like, apply today so that you get the stamp of approval that you've applied and received the scholarship by, April, you know, maybe mid April. So you are most likely to be eligible for funds because what's been happening is the, the enrollment period is open till June or July, but then those people, what they say is you're eligible, but there weren't enough funds. You have to wait till next year. And then if you reapply next year, they'll put you at the beginning of the line. Okay. And what if you're like, okay, so if like, okay, you want to apply, uh, uh, guard, like the scholarship gardener and like the kid is a charter school, but you want to use the resource like this funds, not towards the school, but towards the therapist and stuff. Like, are you still eligible or no? Yes. Okay. So it's good. Like, so what I, and like for like private, like tutoring or like any other therapist, like mm -hmm. you're good. Yep. Okay. And the parent can use it multi prong So let's say you get more ABA, you're going to need more money for ABA than you would for speech. Then you can use that. You have the flexibility of using it where you want it. Okay. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Anyone have any other questions? Yes, I, um, I didn't hear uh, if Maria was asking about charter school or private school. Private school. Private, okay. Mm -hmm. Yep. Anyone else? Gardner's a little funny. The other thing when you have Gardner is the parent has to approve the expense. So whenever, let's say, they want to pay for ABA, we can petition because we're a direct provider. Well, B, uh, PBS is. Um, hey, this is the bill. The parent just has to go online and approve it. Now, there are other things that if you're not a direct provider, you have to be a little bit more cautious of. But for the most part, they approve everything that you know is under the direct provider list or if you submit a claim and approve that. So that's a really, really cool kind of option to have. All right. So sorry, friends. Okay, here we go. So recommendations. All right, my big thing here is communicate with your child's developmental team on an ongoing basis. What are their specific goals? And kind of be aware that you need to start prepping for transitions a year in advance. Let me, let me preface this. You need to start prepping for the transition from early intervention to school around a year in advance. Right, you want to see what are the goals that are missing for this child to kind of enroll in a mainstream classroom if that's a desire. Who are the team members we need if that's the desire or whatever it is that we need. We got to make sure that that's in place. Okay. So then we also have to ask about strategies and opportunities that can be practiced in home or within community settings that can help continued learning. What do I mean by that? A child can perfectly be able to sit and learn and receive instruction at home. And it may look different completely when they're in school settings because they're not used to kind of being, sharing a space with 15 other kids. This one's screaming, this one's laughing, the teacher's trying to give instruction. Like you may need to almost generalize those behaviors so that they also occur within, not just within the home, but in other settings. Do they also know how to, you know, remain in place and safe in a park? And then start early guys. Like if we know this information, you have a learner that's two, awesome right like you can get them enrolled in all these programs and they can start getting stuff 
It doesn't mean that we don't like help our older learners, but if you can get this early on, the resources available for these families are just so much better. Um, and the other thing too is make sure they sign up for parent trainings when we have these global parent trainings um, or at Child Find Card has a ton of great resources and training. Just go to ARC, they have a huge like advocacy program that's done for free. So I always tell families, especially with CARD, CARD has a lot of good resources and they're all free. And they forget, like usually when they first get diagnosed, you go to CARD and then you forget they exist. CARD is there from the time from birth to death. So any transition you're experiencing. So like, hey, I'm having a hard time finding a tutor. I just wrote to them like two days ago about that. Um, they're going to get back to me in a little bit. They're very good about getting back quickly, working with us. They make um, a ton of, of items for us too. So like I had our card member make um, a little girl. I have a me book. It was the cutest thing ever. So like we sent her pictures and she made us our visuals because I wasn't able to at the time. And so it was really, really nice that she was able to take over and do that for us. So I really like, I'm a big lover of CARD and promote them a lot because it's a free resource. So any resources we have, I really feel like we need to take advantage of them. Autism Speaks generally tends to have some good resources of like a, a therapy base, kind of where to go for transitions. ARC is now a new one that I know of. Um, so depending on the county, you can go to ARC in Miami or you can go to ARC in Broward to help orient a family. And they have advocates that are available for free, right? And really have no interest in the game, which is great. So then let me touch a little bit, it's not in the PowerPoint, um, on Medicaid and disability, because that's really, really important. Okay, well, let me do this. Sorry, friends. It's my Ukraine family. They're up. <laughs> um, all right. So does anyone have any questions about Gardner or McKay right now before I go on? Okay. So now there's specific transitions. I was really mainly speaking to the transition from early intervention into the schooling, school age process. Now, Lisette's going to cover more of the transition, one, to the onset of puberty. So the transition that occurs kind of middle school to high school, I'm going to help her form. And then the transition, the big transition that occurs into adulthood, right? And being out left into the world. So there is a program called MedWaver, just so you guys are kind of getting an understanding of it. MedWaver is available to anyone who meets and qualifies for what it is. Um, need is based on not just a diagnosis, but on the severity of the diagnosis. Now, it's a state run, no income base. It's just kind of based on necessity. And then you're kind of given carte blanche, like a $40,000 check to dispense for a child to have resources. If that means you need to hire another aide, if you have a parent caretake of that person full time. But Lisette's going to really speak into what MedWaver is much more than I can. Um, but just so you are aware, that is a resource available to young children as well as older children. Now, the other big portion is if you have a child service through Medicaid, there are services available through Medicaid, through ABA providers, speech therapy, OTs. I, it was great because Maria asked me this question. Speech and OT actually don't have a lot of difficulty with billing as much as ABA does with Medicaid. It's our fault, let's be honest. And, and we have to kind of take claim to that because we're in South Florida. I never committed Medicaid fraud, but half of South Florida did. And that's why Medicaid has now complicated the system so much. And just to meet the eligibility and the paperwork is so taxing that sometimes it's not even worth it to like be a Medicaid provider because of reimbursement rates and a lot of other issues. That's why you see a lot of ABA companies just kind of stay away from Medicaid, which sucks because a lot of the Medicaid population really needs it and they don't have a ton of providers. So it's kind of like a quant uh, this ever ongoing battle that I'm kind of curious to see how it ends up. It's not like that in all states, but in Florida, it's really become like that because of the amount of fraud that there was. Yeah, it's like, I think like for at least one year, there was a moratorium on accepting the new providers at all. So nobody can do that. No, and it was a year and a half. A year and and a half. They, yeah, and they, they were just accepted. But uh, if you enrolled as a group or for, for example, there's a company and you enrolled as a group, uh, but if you want just to enroll the, like by yourself as an individual, you can do this still. No, Yvette, we don't. Oh, no, yeah. So, Yvette, just so you're aware, no. 
I'm not sure now with Cultivate because Cultivate does uh, in other countries, in other countries, my God, my brain's fried. In other states, Medicaid does not exist in other countries. In other states, um, I don't know if we'll start the process now, but that's TBD. Um, heartbreaking. Um, I, I just met a family. They have a nine, he's going to be nine year old in December, boy. He speaks, he says like 10 words. Okay. And I wanted to cry because he never got ABA. And I asked mom and she goes, oh, no, see, no one accepts CMS. Ah, mm -hmm. oh, gosh, I just... Yeah. CMS, it just, like, I know what you're talking because, like, my... So like, CMS uh, is now called State Well, FYI. That's a really good, so all these questions, really good for this, that, FYI. So like CMS, CMS, Florida Kid Care is just a disaster. <laughs> I, I mean, like, maybe just regular pediatrician, it's good, but for any type of services, it's, like, exists but it's not so it's just <laughs> but as Lisette will tell you the good thing is is that CMS and Medicaid will provide respite services that a lot of private insurances do not uh I think it's stay well or stay safe I can't that's a Lisette question that yep so hold that one down um they basically what happened is there is Florida Kid Care and CMS they got bought out by a new state agency called state well I believe um, and so state well runs now the program, but basically kind of what happens is with families like that, what I recommend is to have two concurrent policies at the same time. What does that mean? You have your Medicaid policy and then you buy, buy on the market what's called a child only policy. What does that mean? You buy a policy just for your kid to get ABA. And there's only one policy right now on the market. And I'm praying to God it continues that way that will do that. And it's a Magellan policy. And we have a couple clients on that policy. And um, if the family cannot pay for it, like, so then my thing is, does the family have Gardner? They had Gardner, they could pay for it because the Gardner allows eligibility to pay for it. Okay. Right? If you if you don't pay for that now, what does that mean? Well care. It might be well care. Thank you, Eva. Stay well. Stay well. Thank you. I knew. Yes, it was it's a well care. I okay, talked to this well. guy. Okay, there it is. Yeah, it's called stay well. Um, yes. So I want to know why is it that the family can't afford it? Because I always tell them you pay $400 a month in a copay is trust me a lot cheaper than paying for ABA per hour out of pocket, right? You're more than likely going to get better services because it's going to cover more. Um, yes, the copays are going to be there. I'm not saying they're, it's not a, a barrier to service, but if there is a scholarship in place that you can use for that, why is that money not being used? And then generally, if I have a Medicaid family, is the first thing I've always asked them is, have you gone to Social Security and applied for disability for your child? That is income eligible, right? But if a family is already qualified for Medicaid, they're obviously already under that income threshold, that they need services provided by the state. Um, and so, okay, then maybe your child is eligible for disability, which means that they get an extra four or $500 a month, which may then be able to pay for that child-only policy. Yeah. What having two concurrent policies does is they can use that Magellan policy to pay for services during for ABA, and then they can use the Medicaid policy to pay for everything else, right? And then when one policy fails, the other one covers. Yeah. So I'll, that's the benefit of that. I'll sure give them this information because I really, I wanted to cry when I heard this. Yeah. Like, but I, I generally see families who say like, well, CMS doesn't accept it. Generally, what I see is they're not well-informed. They are correct in that, but there are some companies that are really good that do accept CMS. One, I can name you two or three off the top of my head. Two, it's probably the fact that you also haven't been educated about resources, right? Because mm -hmm. you have to almost educate yourself. And Lisette's story is kind of like tragic in some way because she's had to educate herself as a parent. And she has like tons and tons and tons of books of like, what, what is it to hack the system? Or like people just call her and they're like, oh my God, Lisette, I don't know. And she like tries to orient them through things. So you have to almost do your homework too. It's horrible that we live in a system that doesn't feed us information, but we live in the age of Google, right? Like you can get connected. Like, uh, and you know who would have told you that? Card. And they're free. So there are services and there are things, lots and lots of things that families don't realize that you have a good card provider and it's a free service. 
and you can tell them, this is my conundrum. What do I do? And then they'll look up for you. Hey, these are some new providers that CMS just provided. Look, we have them in the area. Oh, I know the person who directs that program. Let me call them. And they get on the phone with them. So there are resources available. It's just about, you're going to have to dig a little deeper and, and go a little harder. So that's just honest. And anyways, what used to happen in the past and what I used to recommend is I, before there weren't any child only policies that kind of came after the Affordable Care Act. But before then, when I was working, I'm like, you know, you could go work at, Stop, uh, at Starbucks or Publix and get, and this is horrible. And I would tell parents, I'm like, go work at Starbucks just to get their health insurance because it covers ABA. That was my other solution, right? Like, and it was like, no, I can't work. And I'm like, oh, you work at night, you work in the morning. <laughs> you got to figure it out. But I feel like if there's, a, if there's a will, there's a way and there's an avenue and there's a resource and there's something we can find. But now we have that child only policy. So you don't have to go work at Starbucks anymore. <laughs> or get <up> CMS. <laughs> okay, so disability, you can go apply through SSI. What I always tell the family, every family I say, keep a very nice thick notebook of your child's records. When you go to SSI, whenever they're open, they're not open. That's why I haven't ever been able to change my last name after I've gotten married. But eventually, whenever coronavirus is done and they're able to open, um, then you can go and you can apply for disability. And then they'll tell you what are the eligibility requirements. And then the interesting thing about disability, even if you qualify, it takes around eight or nine months to kind of receive the first payment. Here's the neat thing. They will pay all those eight or nine months on the first check. So a lot of the families that I've seen that apply for disability that need it, which are my Medicaid families, that I've kind of encountered throughout my life, they're eligible from anywhere from like, the lowest I've heard is 330, all the way up to $500 a month. Okay, it's not a ton of money, but 330 or 500 extra coming in is a big help, big, big, big help, right? So then that can kind of go a long way for your kiddo. So those are kind of some of the resources and avenues that we use for them. Okay, guys. So right around the I remember. Mm -hmm. I don't remember. Like I think that the, especially this disability thing, it's not related to income, but I can be mistaken. It I is. think the Medicaid. It is. It's it still. Is. It is for SSI. It definitely is. Um, not for Gardner, not for McKay, but for SSI, it's definitely related to income. Yeah, I have learned that lesson unfortunately six times because I will send people money and I'm like, they're like, no. If you're not below that poverty threshold line, they're not going to do it. But almost everyone who's on Medicaid will be eligible income wise because the threshold for Medicaid is like, I think uh, two times the poverty level or something. I I'm not quite sure what, what it is uh, off the top of my head. I have to look it up. But I think it's like two times above the poverty line. I think you're covered through Medicaid and it varies per state. But I mean, the poverty line is like sad. It's like $13,000 a year. Like it's really hard. Like anybody making thirteen thousand dollars a year, like you're you're roughing it in a lot of ways. Because to think about covering food, shelter, just your necessities with thirteen thousand dollars is really hard. So, any questions, also, anybody? Mm -hmm. It's not a question. It's a comment. Just maybe like more observation. Uh, I think like one more reason why a lot of companies do not accept Medicaid is just pretty simple. I don't know, it, I can't say for every single family, but it's just a general tendency. Mm -hmm. When there is a Medicaid families, they don't really, um, so it's free. And when you get it for free, it's a kind of different attitude about it, maybe. And so that's yeah. like, they take it just, okay, it's sometimes they don't really appreciate it, they don't really dig into this they don't really involve as much as they should and when people are paying money they're just like oh i know like i'm paying for this oh can you teach me that can can i can i can you explain me what what are you doing like and what's next so like they're really involved because like they want to know where the money goes to. yeah and like medicaid is just like they were just treating like like you experience babysitting you know that's what i because i've experienced a lot of medicaid families and that's Generally, not everybody, but generally, that's a feel you have. Yeah, no, and I hear you there because it's not, right, when you're paying for something, sometimes you're, the investment and what it costs you, you're really kind of motivated by it. But I've kind of had the, the coin flip both ways, right? I've had people just, they're in a disadvantaged economic situation. And I think we can easily become babysitters to anybody. 
And that's kind of a failure of us to not educate the parent and not kind of put our foot down when we needed to put our foot down. But yeah, I would tell you it happens much more often, I think, in Medicaid than it does in, in private pay families. Yeah, like rarely do you have a private pay family who doesn't want to be involved in care. Very rarely. Even if they have, like, I have families, I, and I'm not kidding you, that are, they, they have to be near billionaires. And they are very involved in services. And for them, this is like, I mean, mom doesn't care. Like, there's a Gucci Fendi bag. Like this money is not money is not an expense to her. Her child's well being is is her expense, and and her her big 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 worry. Okay. But then I've also had fam families of very affluent means just be very horrendous parents. So sometimes that happens. <laughs> I mean, Jessica, you're probably preaching that. She's like more on that high end of the spectrum. Like sometimes you, you help too much that you're a deficit or you're so little involved that it's also a deficit. So it, it's kind of like you, you'll have your issues back and forth. But I think the accountability or the way that you do things has to be very strict from the beginning, no matter who you're servicing under what payment plan. Alrighty, guys. So I think this was a really good lesson. Does anyone have any other questions, concerns, comments? This part of the presentation is part of that that email that you had sent us, right? Did I send you an email? Hold Didn't on. you send this one that was on transition? The PowerPoint. Yes. Yes. It, oh, this is this is all in that transitions. So the part that Lisette will do next week is going to be kind of the transition into adulthood that I really mm -hmm. like for you guys to kind of get an understanding of because let's say you even have a young learner who's, well, not super young, but like a younger learner, like eight or nine, the wait list for med waiver, for example, is 11 years. You want that person to be enrolled as early as possible because then by the time their number comes up, they might actually meet eligibility, right? You don't want to wait, and this is what happens to a lot of families, they wait till 17 to apply. Then, oh boy, you're stuck like Chuck for the next 10 years. Yeah. And then you really have a problem, okay? So that's why it's really good to be kind of educated on, on both ends of the spectrum and then I want to send you guys out before that just kind of an understanding of like mental health advocacy where it's gone well and where it's gone wrong and kind of who's been the poor victim of where it's gone wrong right because we only ever hear the sides and the abuses of what happened in state institutions and I think it's really interesting to understand what has deinstitutionalizing done in the last 60 years and you know what i mean like we didn't have a ton of homeless people now we have a ton of homeless people what do you think they used to be and lots of people who are mentally ill incarcerated unfortunately not getting access to treatment not getting community support that they need so i feel like there's two sides to a coin like i'm i'm very much about people not having their rights taken away from them but then what do you do with that population that right now has no resources and that desperately needs resources so I'm going to send you something on DJ, um, DJ Jaffe, who is like very big. He unfortunately just passed away. Yeah. Sort of sad, but really, really great advocate for um, it. Well, he says he is not a mental health advocate. He is, <laughs> he is an educator on the seriously mentally ill. Okay. Awesome. All right, guys, I will see you very soon. Oh, hold on.